welcome everybody to the second Sunday poetry series. I'm so glad you can be here today to join us for some amazing poetry. I think this is going to be a great day. I'm your host, Sean Killingsworth, and thank you all for coming. It's really just great to see everybody and to see so many lovely faces. Um, and I'm so glad to be able to present you with some great poets. Um, I also want to say thanks to all of you for spreading the word about second Sunday poetry on your social media and verbally to your communities. Um, and please keep doing it, right? Share, 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 get us out there. Let's get going. I'm very excited to hear some great poems. Oh, it's please feel free, by the way, to post your whatever links you have in the chat so that the attendees can purchase your books. All right, so first up is Erin Redfern. Uh, her work has recently appeared or is forthcoming in Rattle, the Hopkins Review, the New Ohio Review, New World Writing, and the Massachusetts Review. She got her PhD at Northwestern, where she was a fellow for the Searle Center for Teaching Excellence. Her chapbook is Spellbreaking and Other Life Skills, which I probably could learn a few of those life skills <laughs> myself. <laughs> and she has served as poetry judge for the San Francisco Unified School District's Arts Festival and has been a reader for Poetry Center San Jose's, and I'm going to say this incorrectly, Mary, maybe Erin, you can correct me, Sejura. Yeah, you're fine. Ah, and DMQ Review. She teaches poetry classes and workshops online. She's at erinredfern.net. And let's see, I think that's it. So Erin, take it away. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Sean, for holding the space and everybody for showing up on a, on a weekend. I'm just delighted to see everybody who's here. I'm, I'm late to the game with this particular poem. Um, this is, this is a response to Billy Collins' poem, Undressing Emily Dickinson. And there have been many, many good responses to uh, rejoinders to his poem written since then. I, I'll, I'll put this in the chat later, but there was a great article in the Paris Review on Emily Dickinson's dress. We have this one surviving dress. And I love the article. And the, her dress is so different from this like brocaded like wrong century elaborate back button dress that Billy Collins was imagining. I just was like, I have to write about her dress. So that's where this poem came from, Redressing Emily Dickinson. And in case you can't tell from Billy Collins title, Undressing Emily Dickinson, he kind of comes up behind the poet as she's in reverie and starts undressing her. Perhaps readers sigh as her lines undo their mental stays, but Billy. Now's the time to drop from your randy hands the tired fantasy of loosing her from that corset. Her easy clean house dress did not require one. The inhale you so plainly heard was most likely the quick zippered dash of a trapped fly against the pane. You are coy Billy at the breakfast table with arms of moth eaten cashmere draped about your neck and white milk dripping from your spoon. I'm afraid you took me for someone who'd wink right back at your apophasis about riding her like a swan into the night. You must have thought we'd recall those other baffled thighs and both get to play in a white hot daydream, Zeus. She closed her eyes to the orchard then, as women do when concentrating on their muse. I can't say I'm interested in where she stood, still as death, passive as the driven snow. Instead, I would like to know what you thought you were doing when you came up from behind and started troubling her dress. The cotton BK would, as you say, be puddled on the floor. So simple a wrap, there would have been nothing for you to explore. No clasps, no whalebone stays. Therefore, no second white shape standing erect upon its own tented strength, coolly watching as the iceberg will eye the Titanic, what you did next. Oh, the mother of pearl buttons, you exaggerate to build a false suspense. There are only these 12 small saucers sensibly spaced down the front, not back. A toddler could in seconds master their design. Now we're fastening them. I see what I'm surprised you didn't note, the Goldilocks pocket on her right hip into which the poet can slip paper, pencil, envelope. For finishing touches, tuck the auburn hair back into its brown snood, where it hangs like ballast for the coursing brain. Replace the worsted shawl, sky blue, to deflect the frosty air and secure from prying eyes and hands her quick integrity. Uh, thank you. 
it's a there's definitely a little feminist uh, streak in my poetry. Um, let me see if I can. I'm going to right now. I'm not used to working on only one screen, so I'm a little bit low, but um, I'm going to put the review article in there. So if you feel like it and you have room on your screen, you can go look at pictures of her dress. Okay. And um, I, I'm not unsympathetic to Billy Collins. I think when he wrote that poem, you know, he was kind of pulling Dickinson out of the ether and giving her a body and giving her sexuality and trying to make her a real person. Um, and the, you know, the poem doesn't age especially well just because she becomes only a body in service to the, the male speaker of the poem. But I, 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 can, I, uh, I feel like in my 20s, I was trying to do the same thing. How, did, how do I put together my female body with my sexuality, with my identity? I mean, I, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough job, Billy. So this poem is kind of about the, a similar thing. I felt like I was reading, for some reason, I just encountered a bunch of poems about sex. And it was like every poet I was reading was phenomenal in bed. Like this was all world shattering, shaking sex. And I thought, well, I'm never going to write a sex poem, I guess. And then I thought, well, maybe what if I just wrote an honest one for me? What would that look like? And so um, that is this next poem. I'm sharing that. There we go. What can I say? I'm not a landscape. I was an American girl. I learned good love is me on the bottom facing up. Good sex is me on the bottom facing down. I can overthink anything, even now, lying sideways between sheets, inches from you. I'm telling you, I think I forget how. Your face I love, now so weirdly strange, I have to ask, have we met before? And here's where you hold still while I climb down from the thought tree, its branches of fog. Your palm on my flank doesn't move while you wait for me to remember, hand over hand, what hands and skin are for. I thought I'd never write a sex poem because I'm not a landscape and you're no conquistador. You don't map my blue rivers or trace with your tongue every hillock and hollow. Also because I can't be serious about your penis. Eager tail wagging its own good self, taut rod dousing for my pleasure. Also because what that pleasure urges me to speak is not sexy, but trades porn's slick ejaculations for lists of dessert toppings. Butterscotch, brickle, hot caramel, or orchestra sections. Yes, yes, the strings and the brass. This, after we've emerged, doe shy from thickets to mingle our warm breath while the green song rises around us. But what else can I say? I like my sex even and gentle. I burn my bedroll, hung up my spurs long ago. When my body arrives from far fields, I like to let it amble toward a heated stable, plunge its muzzle in cool water, hay racks full and sweet. Later, we'll nicker and lean into each other, dreaming wild herds of words that startle and roam, darken a far ridge, then disappear. And... <laughs> I'm going to put for, well, let's see. I'm put, the ghosting the end of this poem is this 90s song. I don't know if anybody else will remember. I'll put it here in case you want to listen to it later. Um, but that, that is, for some reason, it's, it's there in this poem in the background. And then I'm also going to post, um, after I wrote this poem, I read in poetry, um, Poetry Magazine, I think last year, sometime in the summer, um, Susan Brown's poem, Still Doing It. So I'm gonna post that also for your, your reading pleasure later in case you're a fan of the honest sex poem. And uh, let's see, I'm looking at my time. Okay. Um, next, um, the other different, really difficult thing to write honestly about, um, is race. So that's what this poem is about. This poem is out in the um, 
addition, the newer edition of um, Rattle, but um, I think it will probably come out as part of their Rattle Daily series later in the summer. So, which is an, I love Rattle Daily. You get a, as, it's, as the name says, you get a poem every day and often you can hear poets reading their work. That's a fun, a fun way to hear new poetry. Crosswalk. So what did I get from this boy I cared for as well as I could and less than he deserved? I wanted to be wanted, which I thought meant loved. Full grown at 12, I'd been a freak towering over, over teachers, out rebounding the boys I had crushes on. By 19, I'd have nibbled praise from anyone's cupped hands. But his praise, bountiful, unabashed praise for a body shamed, a cherishing most white boys don't learn. I guess we invested in our own kind of social security when we coupled his Will Smith fade to my Meg Ryan blonde, which he might sometimes have used as shorthand for, don't ask, I belong. Well, I learned new ways to see dogs, pools, the states we had to drive through without stopping. That summer, he took me to meet his mom, a teacher who raised her boys right. Could she tell how wild I was for his height, his strength, that I never told anyone? Made me think of the 80s sportscaster, Jimmy the Greek, and my dad repeating what he said, that the most athletic players were black, but they still needed a smart white quarterback. Shit, I love my dad, but he said it, I heard it, it's in me. And nothing I knew or knew to reach for could help me hold that hateful memory alongside my boyfriend's beauty, his whip-smart wordplay, his open face and hands. I didn't even always see him, the way the faces of those we love blur in close-up. Only his curling eyelashes stayed. And after we graduated, his silky neck, the scent of it where I pressed my face, waking on the couch in his parents' basement, imagining I'd do anything not to lose this, and young enough to think permanence was a goal I could set though he was never more lost to me than my own self. At least as much as I could, I paid attention. Once in Chicago, I was ranting because a man slowed down in the crosswalk. I mean, he stared at me behind the wheel of my F-150 and slowed down. And my boyfriend said, don't get salty. He's just saying no white person can make him move. And I sat there and listened. I let that sink in. And I gotta say, I, that poem should have about six authors on it. I got so much help uh, writing that poem. Really, really, it feels like a group effort. And I'll check my time again. And I had to, you know, I wanted to defend my dad in that poem and for the poem to work, I couldn't defend him, um, but I'll defend him a little bit here. I don't know if he was saying, if he was repeating what he heard ironically or not. And I was really little, so. I took everything literally. I was telling my husband yesterday, when I was five or six, I think I saw that scene in Animal House where John Belushi smashes that guy's guitar against the wall. And you know, I remember thinking, that's, that's wrong, that's mean. Like I just, you know, I was literal. We're literal at that age, we don't have that sense of humor. So he could have been ironic, but it didn't, didn't really register with me. Let's see. I think I had an, I had two more poems, but I think I'm going to take it to one just to make sure we have lots of breathing room and time. This poem is, um, it's not, it's, it's been worked on, but it's not really polished or finished. It hasn't been published anywhere. Um, it was more of a playing kind of poem. Um, I wrote it before. Um, yeah, any, I'll, I'll just read it and you'll see that I'm kind of playing and I'm, I'm, to um, the context is you need to know that Florence Ballard or Flo Ballard was one of the Supremes and um, she had a gorgeous voice, probably the best uh, actual vocal talent in the group um, and a really uh, hard life and I admire her. Um, and there are many devoted fans <laughs> of Flo Ballard out there today who are you know, championing her, her voice and her art. And I usually don't get this overtly political in poems, but I, I, was having a, I was having a day. If you could see your way, Ms. Ballard. The Supreme Court these days, with each decision, it's more supremacy, 
less supremeness. I'd rather have the Supremes. Bye-bye, Brett. Piss off, Neil. Hasta la vista, Amy. Bring in Mary, Diane, Flo, as they were mid-60s, bejeweled, mascarad, wigged, now rising, flanked by the marble columns, set off in sequins against the red velvet drapes. Now promising our country under siege, I'm giving you your freedom. Go back further to Florence at 16, the initiator, self-installed at the studio, wrangling auditions, hand claps and backup, writing out the almost hits, big voice soaring from the slick refrain of buttered popcorn. She could have sung in the Sweet Peas, the Darlene's, but named herself a Supreme because I like the way it sounded. Ms. Ballard, I'm just a white girl from the suburbs, but maybe I know what you mean. Sometimes we find a sound that finds us right back, that founds us. Lead, soprano, supreme. Your voice speaking to you like the first poem that made me more myself than I had been. I wish I could tell you our country isn't still overrun with unscrupulous people. Just the sort who flayed your sulky soul for its gold lining. But remember yourself at 15, how life was more promised than pain, how you tried to hold the high notes, then became them, the world wide and beautiful as a throat you could set vibrating. Be that fearless again. Justice needs a new look, Miss Ballard. The highest court in the land could use the greatest girl group of all time. When the suits argue before you that the powerful must be protected at the cost of the decent, take the lead you were born for. Show us the Supremes standing together, arms up, palms out, coursing, stop in the name of love. Miss Ballard, if you could see your way to come back to us, America is in need of you today. Raise us up, unarm us, unharm us, return to us, return us to ourselves again. Okay, and that is just about time. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Erin. Just absolutely. I adore poems where you get to see the poet's mind at work. And I feel like we got that with all of these poems. Thank you so much. So our next poet up to the mic is Nancy Miller Gomez. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Best American Poetry 2021, Best New Poets 2021, The Adroit Journal, New Ohio Review, Alaska Quarterly Review, Shenandoah, River Sticks, The Rumpus, Rattle, Massachusetts Review, and so many other places. Her chapbook, Punishment, was published in 2018 as a part of the Rattle Chapbook series. She co-founded with Ellen Bast an organization that provides poetry workshops to incarcerated men and women. She grew up in Kansas and currently lives in Santa Cruz, California. Um, and before Nancy, before you get started, Erin, uh, if you could, if you wouldn't mind switching the host back over to Glenn, that would be perfect. Thank you. So, Nancy, if you are ready ready to go. Okay, then. Um, I, uh, first of all, Erin, you are such a hard <laughs> to follow. I was really hoping I was going to go first because I did not want to have to follow either Leo or Erin, <laughs> and here I am having to, to follow you. But, um, and I loved that you popped the poems up for everybody to read. I wish I was organized enough to have thought of that. Um, I, I loved reading the poems as you were reading them. So, um, but I'm not that organized, so I'm not going to do that. In fact, I am so disorganized. I wasn't even sure what I was going to read, but I am going to set a timer so I don't go over because that I'm, that I'm learning from you, Erin. Um, I'm going to start with a poem that uh, it's it's not new, but it's still kind of a work in progress. Um, I'm working on a series of poems where I take headlines from news articles um, and turn them into, or I take a snippet from a news article and I turn it in. I I write in response to it, and this is one of those. And and then I use the quote from the article as a as an epigraph. This is called "Ode to the Nonconformist." and the quote from the news article. Evidence is mounting that a tiny subatomic particle seems to be disobeying the known laws of physics. New York Times. 
tiny lepton, tatted head to toe, sporting a leather jacket and a Harley, waving its middle finger at physics. As it faces down the four fundamental forces of nature with a cocksure, fuck you, to all the milk toast particles who get starstruck and giddy when this punk morsel stage dives into the mosh pit of relativity and breaks all the cosmic laws, slam dancing to its own subatomic transmix. Even when accelerated and smashed and fat shamed, this overweight electron continues to mock an international team of 200 scientists with its too cool for school behavior. When the laws of physics mandate that it spin, it does the opposite. Some say this rebel might hold the key to the mysteries that have long preoccupied our lonely species. Some say it carries the secrets of dark matter in the confines of its supercharged soul. And they intend to torture a confession out of this infinitesimal insurgent so they place its bad ass onto a track and make it run through a superconducting circus act at minus 450 degrees to study its peculiar wobble. Oh, puny humans, they are no match. I cheer for the muon. Keep silent, little one. Hold on to your secrets, even as the entire universe hangs in the balance. So um, just to follow up with that, in addition to um, writing poems uh, that are kind of in response to news articles, I also peruse avidly uh, certain social media channels and look for absurd things that I can also write and respond to. Um, and one of my favorite sources for potential poems is um, the site next door. Does everybody know that site? It's where neighbors get on and they, you know, they complain about shady figures walking down their street and, you know, coyotes and I mean, it's just ridiculous. And then they get into squabbles with each other. Anyway, um, someone in, in my next door community had posted a, about um, a UFO that he was seeing in the night sky. And um, several of the neighbors responded to reassure him that it wasn't in fact a UFO, it was Venus, that Venus was in that particular trajectory. And he got into an argument with them because he was convinced it was a UFO and it got quite heated. Um, so this poem begins with a quote from that, from, his, uh, from, this, from that rather amusing dialogue. It's called Letter to My Neighbor Who Believes Venus is a UFO. And this is the quote. All I'm asking as a public service is to see if anyone else has seen these craft because we don't know what they're doing and what they're up to. And it's a national security issue. If you want to believe it's a planet, that's your business. I don't like corresponding with people who are negative and accusatory. Posted on social media site next door. Dear David, I, for one, am grateful for your service, scanning the night sky for security threats when you could be zoned out in front of your big screen with a whiskey sour and a plate of hot wings. Please forgive our neighbors. They don't know how easy it is to get discouraged. Once I found a small pterodactyl on the sidewalk of a seaside town in France. I tried to warn the shopkeeper but she shooed me off. Perhaps my French was bad, or maybe she didn't want to know that dinosaurs still flew amongst us. Since then, I've stayed quiet. I haven't told about the bobcat scat on my driveway that spells out the initials of my name, or that I can smell suffering in the pine sweat of the drought-stressed cedars, their trunks riddled with beetles and boreholes. I haven't told about the sounds the earth makes before a tectonic shift, how it sighs and groans as if giving birth. Do you hear it too? Now I've begun to pay attention. There are so many signs. Even if nobody else cares, we must remain watchful. Lately, I've noticed violent storms 
disguising themselves as people. Some of them have guns. As for the UFO, if you see it blinking in star code, please decipher the message. Maybe it's trying to help. Thanks. Hmm, let's see, time-wise, how I'm doing. Oh, I got a few more minutes. Um, well, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read new stuff that I haven't been reading lately in a while. So um, I'm gonna read something um, that's just kind of fun. I think it's fun. Um, it's called The Game. I love you, I say to the boy, he's three. I love you more, he says back. But I love you most, I reply, and wonder when love became a competition. I love you more than Halloween candy, I say. I love you more than sky, he shouts. I love you so much, I must dance around the house all night doing this, and I demonstrate the move, which looks something like pitching a baseball with both hands while shaking my ass. He looks impressed, comes back with, I love you, 50 bonks on the head and slaps the back of his own noggin again and again to show me what this kind of love looks like. I love you the whole driveway and parking lot. I love you every pothole in New York City. I love you more than A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I love you more than purple, more than gold. I love you more than cat vomit and dog poop. I love you all the dead people in the cemetery. I love you eyeballs and bones and rotting skin. And, and he's looking around wildly for the right thing to say, his eyes scanning the floor, the ceiling, the shelves. And then I love you so much, I hate you. We stare at each other across the kitchen. I know what he means. I love you so much. I hate you too. Uh, so I think I'm gonna close with one. Um, it's an old poem. I haven't read it in a very, very long time. And I think what made me think of it, I wasn't planning to read it, but um, Erin reading that poem that had the, the um, where she felt like she had to defend her father afterwards. Um, this is a poem I wrote about my father that I feel like I should defend him afterwards because he was an absolute gem of a human being, but you wouldn't always have known that from the way he behaved. Um, so uh, this is called The Scientist's Daughter. I have carried it with me the morning at the Kansas City Farmer's Market when my father and I stood in front of a stall where a man sold pork rinds, pig's feet, and other things we didn't eat. In the back of his trailer was a sleeping sow with her litter of sucklings. My father pushed me closer to see the babies tugging at the mother's teats, her skin whiskered and wrinkled like the face of an old lady. The piglets piled beside her, their clean pink bodies clamoring for milk. I was my father's daughter. I didn't play with girl things, though the babies made me ache. But my father had turned his attention to the pig farmer, an obese man sitting on a low stool, frying bacon on an electric grill, rashers piled on the plate beside him. As he ate, grease dripped onto his chin. The man saw my father watching. He wiped one hand across the thighs of his overalls, then dabbed a dish towel the color of soot against the folds of his shining face. The air was thick with the smell of pigs and manure and the odor of frying. The farmer watched my father watching him. I wanted to walk away, but my father's hands were on my shoulders. My father, a man who moved through the world as though people were specimens in his own private lab. I heard his voice before it arrived, waited for it, like the hiss of water hitting a hot pan. Look, honey, a fat man eating bacon. 
He said it as if his words were a gift he was delighted to give me. He said it so loud, the air curled up and died around us. The man stopped chewing and the hand that held the bacon froze as if he was a conductor caught in a fermata of sadness, still holding his wand of burnt meat. It's been so many years. I would do it again. I would wipe the farmer's face with my sleeve. I'd say, I'm sorry, sir. I would grab the babies and run. Okay, I'm going to do one more short one, and then I, we get to turn it over to Leo. Oh, I can find it. So um, this poem is called Still. The last apple hangs on into winter, shriveled and brown as a shrunken head. It holds onto the branch, even while falling further into itself. Drops of rain sweat slide down its mottled skin, catch light from the sun, and turn gold. Isn't persistence beautiful? The woman who shows up daily for her dose of methadone. The man punching the clock shift after shift, though he carries his heart through each day in a cold, empty chest. The small boy who tries to make sense of the lines his teacher has made on the chalkboard. How do we keep on? The bird drops its song over and over, picking it up and dropping it, little notes spilling down the mountain. My father on his deathbed, eyes still filled with wonder. He lingers longer and longer in the space between each breath, stepping carefully onto the ledge of his last thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Just beautiful. What a, a wonderful variety of different kinds of poems. Funny and sassy and really touching. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Loved it. Okay. So we have our last poet now. Um, our third final poet is Leonora or Leo Simonovis. She's the author of Study of the Raft, which is the winner for the 2021 Colorado Prize for Poetry. Her work has appeared in Gargoyle, the Quelly Journal, Diode Poetry Journal, Tinderbox, and The Rumpus, among others. She's been the recipient of fellowships from Women Who Submit, Bona, and the Poetry Foundation. A Venezuelan American poet, Leo lives in San Diego and teaches Latin American literature and creative writing in Spanish at the University of San Diego. So with no further ado, Leo, please take it away. Thank you, Sean. And Nancy, that was wonderful. I love those next door poems. I remember reading them in their um, drafts. And I just, I don't know how you do it, but anyway, you're hard to follow too. <laughs> So um, I'm going to be reading from uh, my book, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat in case you're interested. I know some of you already have it. Um, and I actually want to start in the middle. I'm, yay, Anna. <laughs> um, I'm not at home today. I'm actually kind of far away. I'm in the Midwest, and um, I haven't been here in a very long time. So today I'm thinking about conversations and connections. And um, most of the poems that I'm going to read are in conversation with each other, or um, they were poems that I didn't know what to do with, and I ended up connecting them all together. So um, the first poem I'm going to read is a very long poem for me, very long because I write short poems. It's called Diaspora Sweet. And um, these were old poems that I didn't know what to do with, and I almost you know, threw them away, just deleted them. And um, someone said, why don't you take the titles away and see if you can connect them all to each other? Because they, you know, the themes are very similar. And I did, and it worked. And now it's like the middle part of my book. Diaspora Suite. There's an invisible linea, a mouth clamp every syllable shut. Speak English, get papeles, reel in your erres, stow all secrets under your tongue. 
hide them from the ones invading your mouth. Stand at the threshold. Show them crossing is not transgressing. If you waylay light, it becomes a part of you, dissecting bodies into face, arms, hands, feet, and other unnameable objects. After the flight, I stumble down a metal staircase, shudder in the sun's insipid warmth. To my right, the Pacific glints like an orderless element. A customs officer asks question after question after question. I autocorrect and apologize, going over prepositions and past tense conjugations. Think about TV shows where Colgate smiles and invite viewers to bleach themselves into perfection. This is no Hollywood movie, and I am not arriving. My name, an unpronounceable obstacle. I apologize for the noise. A cab driver asks where I'm from. I say farther than Mexico, no English. I say we fry the fish whole and suck on the eye for luck until all that remains is a little white ball rolling erres on the tongue. I say we watch lightning pry open the horizon. Sounds like a wonderful place. You have beautiful skin. Your teeth are very white. My abuela told me about a little boy who opened his mouth to show his teeth. No scars on his back till a planter bought him. He had beautiful skin too. I finger my passport, its corners lifting like the hook on a fish's lip pulling up memory. The officer sorts bones in an orderly fashion, femurs and scapulas and a humerus disconnected from its radius. One sternum polka dotted by bullet holes. He tags the bones with green pieces of paper that don't translate into cards, a living wage, a hospital bed. He flexes his muscles, ripped from chasing the ghosts who left behind this mess. He couldn't catch them, grab them, grind them so there would be no evidence like there is now. Sand, dirt, and marrow. Dust of my dust, says the Bible. A ghost carcass dozes on hot coals, flavors infused by soil and dung. Men tear meat pink by the setting sun. They drink aguardiente, slice grains of sand with their blade, toss them in the water to exercise their fear. Living on the border, they grow stories from seed, toss them over the fence, losing La Llorona and Huitzilopochtli on the other side. If you swallow a fallen star, you can cross on the back of a flying coyote, they tell the children, like Aladdin and the genie. They never tell them El Norte means nowhere. Isabel looks at the other body. No puedo aguantar más. Her Spanish, both refuge and obstacle. She left her home and two children in Venezuela after being kidnapped, robbed, shot, marked as enemy by her government. Panama City, Bogota, Cancun, Mexico City, and Mexicali. North is freedom, or was. When her children wore carnival costumes in Caracas, they believed they were Wonder Woman and Batman, ready to fight crime. She wants to believe, but her faith has already expired. She slips her fingers through the bars to touch another caged human. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's over this one. Um, so that last part of the poem was, um, I was doing a little bit of research on the border because I live in San Diego and I take my students to visit the fence because they hear all their stories and they have no idea what's going on. Um, and so we always think about the border with Mexico as like, oh, just Mexicans cross the border, but that's not true. There are people from all over the world, Cuba, Haiti, Argentina, all kinds of places. And so um, I found out about this Venezuelan woman who was detained and kept um, in, in Mexico for quite some time. I think she hasn't gotten out yet. Um, the next set of poems I'm gonna read are posters from everywhere and nowhere. I wrote this during the pandemic, um, thinking about, again, connections. Um, we were all so isolated. And so I was thinking about writing postcards to different people, um, mainly my cousins, and just um, thinking about what it means to be 
connected at a time when it's impossible to see others in person, to hug, to touch, um, and to just be in conversation. Postcards from everywhere and nowhere. Dear cousin, I just landed. At the airport, a picture of a ship crowning a wave. A figure on the pro waits, like you on the tarmac looking somewhere ahead. I waved and you did not wave back. Maybe you couldn't see me. Dear cousin, I chant, I'm home every day. How many times will it take to feel it? The monarchs are starting to cocoon. Do you know if when they transform, they forget their past? Dear cousin, papers are important in this land. My neighbor told me about Chinese paper sons who invented new identities so they could stay. I think, the paper, I think of the paper dolls we played with, how we unfolded each tab of the wedding dress and turned it into confetti. Dear cousin, what happens when your genetic code is grafted in two languages? Does it mean the patterns never stop shifting? Yesterday, we had an earthquake in San Diego and I heard the earth grinding, its teeth as if to speak. Dear cousin, my son asked if citizen is a foreign word. I was tempted to say yes. I told him there was once a city whose people were not alien, they belonged. Oh, so where do we belong? He yeah. asked. This next two poems are um, about language. And um, for me, language is related to the tongue. I love the word tongue and I love writing about the tongue. Um, so um, I wrote them thinking about um, how, how people um, perceive others who don't speak the same language um, and what it means to speak more than one language. Like in my head, the languages don't fight with each other, they're just there. And sometimes one comes out and sometimes it's the other. Um, but I think if someone just speaks one language, it's, that's very hard to understand. Um, so this first poem is of mouth and tongue. She lets the tongue out, la lengua, on a leash, then reels her back, an act of love and a habit. Lengua, both bus muscle, memory, and language, mother tongue, a voice at the back of the mouth. I want to write a book called The Lengua of My Boca since speaking my lengua is becoming a forgotten art. In the news, they talk about a man found this side of the river, Boca de Rio. He spoke another lengua, was on his back, open mouth, tongue on a bridge. And this is Father Lengua. And this is for everybody who has had their name mispronounced or butchered in so many different ways. My father speaks English with feros and isos. His pointer fingers cross one on top of the other to push away mal de ojo. His right hand quickly makes the sign of the cross. He's a master in lip pointing, mouth puckering towards an object or person. No need for translation. I tell him he's a polyglot. His body speaks where words fail. People comment on his accent, mispronounce his name, call him ex-savior as if he had fallen from grace and could not be redeemed. Xavier, he says, over and over. It's Basque, but they think Basque is a painter. When I buy him coffee, I take the cup from the barista's hands and write his name as many times as it takes for all to see. All right, I got two more. And this is for all Californians. Um, thinking about wildfires and especially a friend of mine who lost part of her home last year in Santa Cruz. So, still life with smoked landscape. California burns stories into ashes. A man picks up a rabbit from the side of the road. 
A couple watched the flames from inside their swimming pool, hands together in prayer. After the rescue, no one asked if the water was hot or what it felt to be island. People's eyes lock on phone screens while outside rage is orange. My kitchen table scratched, one vertical line for each life lost. In Julio Cortazar's house taken over, the owners are chased away by voices. Fire can speak, but would rather not hear. From my window, I see monarchs fall, wings cinched in mid-flight, prayers unanswered. And this last poem is Bedtime Story, just finishing with a little softness. Every witch moth has a pact with death. All night she soars to her flight until paralyzed by pleasure, she plummets, bending gravity around the center of her own galaxy. In this story, bat-shaped wings, the color of the devil's dreams, deprive children of sight. In the morning, a mother finds the witch moth's body splayed as if waiting to be read. There's something satisfying about open ending, like the story I made up where you and I find an eagle's feather and graze its barb, fingers flushed with the promise of light. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Ugh, what a great reading. Wow. Thank you, Erin, Nancy, and Leo for sharing your work with us. Today has really been an absolute pleasure. Um, and, you know, as a poet myself, I, I almost always feel inspired by these readings. And today, I feel like I've got some very specific ideas percolating for new poems. So I am particularly grateful to the three of you. <laughs> So thanks to everybody for joining us today. I hope to see all of you in July for the next installment of Second Sunday Poetry. The date for that is July 10th. So it's at three o'clock as always. Um, thanks again, everybody. And uh, I hope to see you next time at SSPS. <laughs> Please follow us on social media and uh, check out the website. We're at Second Sunday Poetry uh, on Twitter. And I'll just echo um, in this, we, we're so over screened and over zoomed. Thank you everybody for showing up today. It's lovely to see you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank Bye -bye you. All. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great rest of your day.